Thank you for listening to the Health and Safety Podcast. I'm Michael Wong, Founder and Executive Director of the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. PPHS has often advocated the need for clinicians to address respiratory compromise, a subject that we have often discussed in reference to patients who have had adverse events or deaths due to opioid-induced respiratory depression. The Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety would like to thank Medtronic for their generous support of this clinical education series. Through the financial support of Medtronic, PPHS can offer this educational series with full independent control over all programmatic and editorial aspects of the series, including selection of the clinicians to be interviewed, discussion topics, and questions asked. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people each year. Medtronic believes its deep clinical, therapeutic, and economic expertise can help address the complex challenges such as rising costs, aging populations, and the burden of chronic disease faced by families and healthcare systems today. But Medtronic can't do it alone. That's why Medtronic is committed to partnering in new ways and developing powerful solutions that deliver better patient outcomes. To help us better understand what is respiratory compromise and why clinicians in their healthcare facilities should care about respiratory compromise and adopt clinical practices to prevent respiratory compromise, today I'm speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Vender. Dr. Vender is Emeritus Chair of Anesthesiology at North Shore University Health System. Dr. Vender has served as the president of the Illinois Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Society of Critical Care Anesthesiologists. Both Jeff and I are members of the Clinical Advisor Committee of the Respiratory Compromise Institute. Jeff is the representative for the Society of Critical Care Medicine. The Respiratory Compromise Institute can best be described as a coalition of medical and safety organizations devoted to raising awareness about respiratory compromise. Dr. Vender is chairman of this Clinical Advisor Committee, so we are honored to hear from Jeff about the Respiratory Compromise Institute and what he hopes the Institute will achieve. Welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Thank you. For the listeners not familiar with you or your work, could you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Uh, I'm a clinical professor of anesthesiology and critical care at the University of Chicago School of Medicine, Pritzker School of Medicine. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist, intensive care trained physician who works in a uh, large university affiliated hospital system in Chicago. Excellent. Today, we're talking about respiratory compromise and the Respiratory Compromise Institute. To get everyone listening on the same page, let's start with your own definition of respiratory compromise, or if you prefer, the definition that the Respiratory Compromise Institute uses. Clearly, uh, there are multi-definitions out there, but the one that I have typically employed and the Respiratory Compromise Institute has used defines respiratory compromise as a state in which there is a high likelihood of decompensation into respiratory failure and or death, but in which specific interventions, be it therapeutic and or monitoring, might prevent or mitigate the the compensation. Thanks, Jeff. As I mentioned previously, respiratory compromise often occurs with the administration of opioids. However, your description of respiratory compromise includes non-opioid situations. Could you please describe some examples of respiratory compromise that may not involve or be associated with opioid administration? Well, there are numerous situations where Patients with underlying pulmonary disease are in very chronic but stable conditions. And for a multitude of reasons, either a therapeutic intervention, the administration of pharmaceutical agents, in particular sedative agents and for narcotics, as you alluded to, or an underlying disease like pneumonia that is acute in nature can take that stable respiratory condition and move it down the spectrum of pathophysiologic deterioration into respiratory compromise, although we had clearly recognized a significant increase in respiratory complications associated with opioid administration. There are other areas, non-opioid related, that can create respiratory compromise. 
We deal with many patients with stable or underlying respiratory conditions, whether it be COPD, sleep apnea, or pre-existent pathophysiology, where either due to sedative agents or an acute illness like pneumonia can go from a stable condition to respiratory compromise and become at risk for respiratory failure. A classic example of that in my world of anesthesia has been the well-recognized area of non-operating room anesthesia, in particular, as an example, endoscopy suites. We do numerous endoscopy procedures under the administration of propofol or other anxiolytic-like drugs, and there has been a well-recognized increased incidence of sentinel events related to oxygenation and ventilation including death. So why do you think it's important for clinicians to recognize respiratory compromise? Or rather, put another way, why have clinicians perhaps not recognized respiratory compromise in the past? Well, I think we've always appreciated patients go through a spectrum or a transition of physiology, pathophysiology, from in an acute illness to a debilitated state. And so I don't think it's a lack of recognition. I think there's been a lack of understanding of how to monitor better or to recognize better those patients at risk. And historically, monitors we have employed routinely and become very comfortable with, like pulse oximetry, have been shown in many situations to actually or potentially be misleading in some of these clinical situations. What tools would you currently recommend to help clinicians recognize respiratory compromise, or should there be a development of new tools? I think the first and most important thing is to recognize, especially with sedative procedures, outpatient-based procedures, non-operating room anesthesia in particular, uh, there is now a recognized, and this is based on closed claims data, an increased risk of deaths, in, in contrast to operating room anesthesia, a higher incidence of respiratory complications, many of them related to inadequate oxygenation and or ventilation. And one of the reasons for this is today, the patients that are being done for non-operating room anesthesia in particular are often higher risk, elderly, and done under sedation. And many people confuse sedation as a benign introduction of relatively limited effect drugs, which isn't really true. So therefore, uh, from a clinician standpoint, is to recognize that the drugs we employ as sedative agents can have variable effects on individuals depending on their tolerance and their underlying condition. Secondly, is to understand the dosages and the effects of the particular drugs employed. And the last thing is how to best assess them beyond just clinical assessment of monitoring routine vital signs like respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure. The most common monitor employed historically has been pulse oximetry, as I alluded to before. But when you administer pulse oximetry with oxygen therapy, we can often delay the recognition of hypoventilation. And that's why more and more people have begun to study and look at the utilization of capnography or CO2 monitoring in the expired gas to earlier detect depressed respiratory rates and or apnea, as well as signs of hypoventilation or inadequate ventilation. So you have alluded to some of the limitations of pulse oximetry. Would you recommend capnography monitoring, as you've outlined? Well, I think, uh, you know, in my own practice, understanding that there has been a whole change in the guidelines of the utilization of capnography. So, for instance, the American Society of Anesthesia now mandates, as a standard of care, the utilization of capnography in procedures Uh, where sedative or narcotic agents are going to be employed. And so it's become part of our mandate 
to do this. I often hear from hospitals that they're changing practices in the event of an adverse event due to respiratory compromise. Although, of course, it's always good to hear that change is being made, they are being made after an adverse event has occurred. What do you think are the biggest impediments to incorporation of monitoring or other tools to recognize respiratory compromise? Well, I I think like all monitoring tools, uh, there's a cost associated with monitoring that uh, people have to accept and recognize. Uh, In addition, there's a familiarity with the utilization the benefit as well as the limitations of specific monitors in different clinical situations, which mandates an educational process to employ these. And in my field of anesthesia, we have become very comfortable with capnography because it's been part of our routine monitoring for several decades. And as I said, it's always been part of the monitoring standard for use with general anesthesia, but that has been extended today, I believe, for patients who are receiving sedative procedures for any patient administered by an anesthesiologist. So you recommend continuous monitoring of these patients outside the OR, outside of general anesthesia? Yes, that's what we are doing today as part of our routine care. Uh, It should be acknowledged not all professional societies who administer sedative agents for procedural care have adopted that and or accept that as their dictum. So the Respiratory Compromise Institute, what do you hope will uh, be achieved uh, through this institute? Well, you know, I think the goal is to try to identify evidence-based medicine that exists in this domain of interest to example and demonstrate the benefits of more astute opiate and or sedative agents, as well as justifying or establishing what are the best techniques to monitor these patients, and then distribute that knowledge to caregivers in a way that we increase awareness and increase adoption. Uh, No different than when the surviving sepsis campaign was developed for sepsis management irrespective of one's perception of the materials provided or the evidence-based medicine used, the surviving sepsis campaign markedly increased clinician awareness of the problem for earlier diagnosis, much more acute intervention, and today, whatever studies we look at, the vast majority, even the control groups for routine care, have been markedly better as far as morbidity mortality than the control groups of studies years gone by. And the reason for that is really just increased better care for more understanding and more awareness, not necessarily a mandate of what to do. So really, the Respiratory Compromise Institute should be about awareness building and encouraging other earlier interventions in these cases. And then the recognition of the magnitude of the problem is, we, as we have discussed here today, we don't talk much about opioids, but just looking at the news today, the opioid crisis is all over the news. In our world of healthcare delivery, it's not a matter of overdoses and or drug availability. It's about the utilization of opioids that have clear impact on the cardiopulmonary system and a variable effect on different individuals based on their underlying clinical condition, and then the marked increase in complications associated with this vast number of patients that are getting opioids uh, that has really driven the awareness in the anesthesia community. And how do we prevent this problem of opioid-induced respiratory depression? in the subset of patients most at risk? How can we better monitor them? Uh, Because today we know that in excess of probably 13 million patients, or at least it's been reported, in excess in the U.S. alone get patient-controlled analgesia and anywhere from 0.1 to 5%, now those are estimates, can suffer respiratory depression from the opioid-induced respiratory depression. 
and this can lead to increased morbidity and mortality. So we need to do a better job of monitoring and understanding the drugs we use and those patients at risk so we can reduce these complications. And I think the Respiratory Compromise Institute's goal is to make that awareness present among all providers. And that's why this is a collaboration of multiple specialties and multiple clinician groups or organizations so we can get that word out to everybody. What are some of the biggest challenges to driving greater awareness of respiratory compromise? Well, driving greater awareness is going to be predicated on getting the information out, number one, but getting adoption of good evidence-based medicine, getting people to, one, recognize this is a real problem, getting people to recognize that a better understanding of what patients are at risk and why, and then techniques we can employ, be it monitoring, clinical observation, to reduce complications is understood and accepted by those providing these agents. Hopefully this podcast will be heard by clinicians and will heed your words and begin to recognize respiratory compromise better and do something to intervene for the patients. Any last words for clinicians that you would advise them of to keep their patients safe? Well, I think all clinicians, their, our goals are to deliver safe, effective care. There's been a great push to reduce pain, almost like a sixth vital sign. But when we do this and we reduce pain, we do it at a cost when we use drugs that impact the respiratory system. And all we can ask for is for individuals to recognize that be it the Joint Commission or other organizations today have looked at this problem as something that is preventable to a certain degree, not totally avoidable, there will always be patients at risk, but to a great degree reduced or prevented by better monitoring to reduce adverse drug events related to opioids and sedative agents. And it's the recognition that it's a problem that we are all dealing with and then a demonstrated willingness to go read and learn about it uh, through many available resources so you can reduce these issues in your own practice. Thank you, Jeff, for talking about respiratory compromise and why clinicians should be aware of this issue. This concludes our podcast with Dr. Jeffrey Vender, and thank you for listening to the Health and Safety Podcast. As a global leader in medical technology, services, and solutions, Medtronic improves the health and lives of millions of people each year. Medtronic believes its deep clinical, therapeutic, and economic expertise can help address the complex challenges such as rising costs, aging populations, and the burden of chronic disease faced by families and healthcare systems today. But Medtronic can't do it alone. That's why Medtronic is committed to partnering in new ways and developing powerful solutions that deliver better patient outcomes.